Amanda Pollock, and I am the Visual Information Specialist for the National Park Service's National Underground Railroad Network to Freedom Program. Welcome to the second episode of the Ranger Roadshow. Our job at the Network to Freedom is to work with people, both inside and outside of the National Park Service, to preserve and share verifiable underground railroad stories. In this series, we invite you to join me on a virtual journey across the country, where you can meet the amazing people the Network to Freedom works with and learn about the incredible stories that we all share. On this episode of the Ranger Roadshow, we are headed to the Boone County Public Library. This library serves to provide tools for people to discover, explore, and experience a lifetime of learning. Since 2017, Boone County Public Library has been listed as a facility in the Network to Freedom, as has their public bus tour. This means that the program and their collections related to the Underground Railroad meet standards for professionalism, accuracy, and accessibility. Last year, Boone County Public Library received a grant from the Network to Freedom to complete their project entitled The Legacy of Enslaved Mothers. The library is working to produce a digital exhibit which highlights the resilience, determination, perseverance, resistance, and sacrifice of enslaved women within Kentucky and the difficult choices these women had to make regarding their families. Today, Boone County Public Library will be sharing the stories they discovered through their research for this project. But before we begin, we do want to emphasize that viewer discretion is advised. These stories involve mature themes, and we will discuss violence towards Black women, violence towards Black children, and the forced separation of families. Although these stories are important to tell, they also contain subjects that are extraordinarily difficult to talk about and can be very triggering to hear. We encourage any viewer that might be under 18 years old to watch with an adult in their life that they can trust. And we encourage adults to take care of their well-being as we learn more about these stories together. Without further ado, let's join Hillary in Burlington, Kentucky, where we will learn more about the Boone County Public Library and their newest Underground Railroad storytelling project. My name is Hillary Delaney and I am the lead researcher for Underground Railroad and African American History here at the Boone County Public Library in the Local History and Genealogy Department. We are part of the Network to Freedom with the National Park Service. We became part of that program for our research facility um, as well as for our Underground Railroad in Boone County bus tour. Um, our facility, we do um, have quite a bit of information online because we want to make it as accessible as possible to anyone who would like to use our research collection. Some of the things that you can find in our collection include family histories. Uh, we also have things like municipal records, like tax lists, um, census records. Uh, we have Bibles here, family Bibles. Um, we have deeds that sometimes include information regarding sales of enslaved people. Our project that we've been working on through a grant provided by the Network to Freedom is called The Legacy of Enslaved Mothers. We thought of this because um, you can't talk about enslavement without considering everyone in the picture. And mothers feature so largely in these stories because their story is not just one of enslavement, but it's also one of fear of being separated from their child, fear of losing their child, um, the joy of having this child, and then the hard decisions that they had to make for their families and themselves. And so we wanted to feature these women and talk a lot about their experience because we think it's so important to, to, to show that. A lot of this history has not been discussed before, at least in our county for sure, and the American experience as a whole. Um, we've been working very hard to try to fill in those gaps and uh, this project is one way that we can reach out to the public. It's going to be made up of five stories and each story has a different theme or person at the center of it, but all involve enslaved mothers. So our first piece is about a woman named Margaret Garner. Uh, a lot of people know Margaret Garner's name. Um, she has gotten a lot of attention because Toni Morrison's book, Beloved, was based on her story. And then the film, of course, was based on the book. Margaret Garner was actually from Boone County. And so we get a lot of questions and a lot of interest about her. Um, kind of a synopsis of her story is that she and her family were enslaved here and they were running away to freedom. 
Uh, they got as far as Cincinnati and they were in a house, sheltered, in place, and the um, slave hunters and the slave holder who had held Margaret and her family um, came and found them and they were breaking into the building. Um, during that time, Margaret made the choice, the horribly difficult choice, that she did not want her children returned to enslavement. Um, she killed her young daughter and she attempted the same with her three other children. At the house near Mill Creek Bridge, Margaret Garner, when a parcel of men rushed into the house, said to me, Mother, before my children shall be taken back to Kentucky, I will kill every one of them. Cincinnati Daily Gazette, January 19, 1856. As difficult as this story is to hear, I think there is uh, no better illustration of what enslaved mothers faced. Margaret had a very strong mother of her own, and this is the part of the story that is not told. Margaret's been written about um, quite a bit and researched quite a bit. Uh, there have been pieces of art that have been produced in her honor. There was an opera, of course, the movie and the book, and many, many academic studies. But with the exception of just a few, her mother, Priscilla, is not really discussed a whole lot. And so we took a look at Priscilla and what it meant um, for Margaret to have a mother who was strong enough to impart that strength to her own daughter. So that story is, is central to the identity of, of enslavement of this area. And so we, we thought it was very important to talk about Margaret and her mother. The next piece that we took on um, is related to Margaret Garner. Um, when Margaret took the life of her young child, um, that act is referred to as infanticide. Sadly, Margaret was not the only mother to make this choice. One that I can think of was in the 1830s. And this woman, who was named Elvira, um, gave birth to a child and took its life. This horrid deed was perpetrated upon the infant immediately after its birth by thrusting it violently under a pile of wood lying in the cellar of the house, thereby mashing its head in such a way that instant death was the consequence. Rising Sun Times, December 5th. 1835. She was tried for murder, but she was also tried for a sort of theft. She stole that property from the slaveholder. So the child that she gave birth to was actually someone's property. Um, and then the punishment that Elvira suffered was death by hanging, ordered by the court. Now in that case, Elvira was the property and the slaveholder would be reimbursed by the county for the cost of the loss of his enslaved person. Um, and so when you step back and look at how removed the slaveholding society was from the fact that this was a human woman and her human child and how, what a terrible, terrible choice she had to make. The abolitionists regard the parents of the murdered child as a hero and heroine teeming with lofty and holy emotions, who, Virginius-like, would rather imbue their hands in the blood of their offspring than allow them to wear the shackles of slavery, while others look upon them as brutal, unnatural murderers. Cincinnati Daily Inquirer, January 20th, 1856. We look at Elvira's story and a couple of other stories in this area, sort of representative of what it meant for enslaved women to even become mothers while they are held in bondage. Um, how, that, how that child came to be. In some cases, the child is resulting from an act of violence against them. When you think about women and the emotions and what happens um, when they are expecting a child, um, it must have been such a terrible, terrible mixed bag of emotions for enslaved women because the joy of having a child would certainly have been darkened by things like the potential for the child to be taken from them, sold away, hurt in some way in front of them, and they couldn't protect them. Um, so these, these mothers are really, um, really important to talk about because that is an act of desperation, but it's an, also an act of defiance, um, and it's an act of love. And so that piece was really important for us to discuss beyond the story of Margaret Garner and her mother, 
Um, and so that, that's the second one that we talk about. Our third segment is about a woman named Jane Stevens. Uh, she was known as Jenny. Um, Jane Stevens was born here in Boone County and um, was the daughter of an enslaved woman and the slaveholder. Um, Jane had a husband uh, named John White and John um, had actually escaped from enslavement and Jane was still here in Boone County with five children. Um, John really wanted his family with him so John came here to free his family. Unfortunately when he came our river was very very high and when the family went to cross the river in a boat they got washed down down river and ashore and scattered. Um, John was able to not be detected right away but Jane and their five children were captured um, and returned to the slaveholder in Boone County. His name was Benjamin Stevens and he saw himself um, as a kind man although we know that Holding humans in enslavement is not a kind thing, particularly your own daughter and your grandchildren. Uh, when Jane and the kids tried to escape, um, he made the decision once they were captured to sell them. Um, he made it very clear that he wanted families to be kept intact, but once he sold them away, he had no control over that. And what happened to them was left to the fate of the person who purchased them. And very soon after, the man who bought them um, sold them all separately. Jenny's story is really interesting because you would think um, during the time that this happened, you know, right around 1850, um, it's very difficult to imagine being aware of what, where your children had gone. So we don't know how Jenny got the information, but she did have enough information to begin the search for her children after the Civil War. So she was separated from them for about 15 years. She married a man named Dudley Carter who was a preacher. Um, so because he was a preacher, he was literate and um, traveled quite a bit and she went with him. So during these travels, they were able to place ads looking for the kids. Jenny was able to find three of her children and be reunited with them and knew some information about the fourth child, um, enough that they knew that she was living in the Louisville area um, as late as 1885. And um, the final child, Cecily, was in the Deep South, and there's no information that says that she was reunited with her family. But Jenny was able to gather a good portion of these kids back together. But Jenny's determination to pull those kids back together is remarkable to me. Um, I, I can't imagine how you get that information out there um, quickly enough, you know, to satisfy this mother's need to see her kids. But the fact that she pulled it off and they all found each other is, is amazing. The next segment that I want to talk about is centered on a woman named Henrietta Wood. And she is one of my favorites to talk about because of her strength. And it's so apparent. And what she achieved is amazing. She was born in Boone County um, to enslaved parents, and she spent her childhood here and then was sold at some point in Louisville. Um, she was taken to the Deep South, and she remained there for a number of years and ultimately ended up in Cincinnati with her slaveholder, um, who manumitted her there, um, which is another way of saying she was emancipated there. The heirs of the people who had held her as a slave in the Deep South were conspiring and they were angry at their mother for having manumitted this woman because she was, she represented wealth to them. So they hired some people to um, trick her into coming across the river from Cincinnati to Covington. She was then kidnapped and, and brought into Florence, which is in Boone County. So ironically, back in the same county um, that she had originally been in as a, as a child. Henrietta is a free woman, having been manumitted sometime since and probably has her free papers now in her possession. The defendants refuse to give any information of her whereabouts and deny the charge made against them. Cincinnati Commercial, June 11th, 1853. In, during this process, as she's being unfairly re-enslaved after obtaining her freedom, 
um, she's being shuffled here and there, at some point she became pregnant. So here she, she is now a mother and being sold to the Deep South where the labor is much, much harder. Um, Henrietta survived all that and kept her child healthy and alive. Um, she ended up returning to Cincinnati after emancipation. So when she returned to Cincinnati with her child, um, she decided that it was time for her to be paid for this illegal enslavement. And she brought suit against um, her captors and the people who conspired with them. Uh, and this is really an early, early, I don't know if it's the first, but this is an early form of reparations that she was asking for through the courts. Uh, she brought suit, she asked for somewhere in the neighborhood of $17,000 to $18,000 which is quite a bit. This is in the uh, 1870s, and so that's quite a bit of money. She ended up winning the case, which is remarkable in and of itself. She didn't win the same award that she asked for. Um, she won somewhere in the neighborhood of $1,800, but still uh, a decent amount of money at the time, and it was money enough for her to take her child, get settled, and uh, eventually put him into law school and her son became quite successful in his own right. She gave an interview that was quite lengthy and very descriptive about her journey. And um, part of it that really uh, is enjoyable to read is the fact that not only is Henrietta described as a, as a tall, statuesque woman, um, she's physically strong, right? But her spirit is extremely strong and it comes through in this interview. And um, I think her legacy is uh, not only that strength, but her ability to spin her reparations for the wrongs that were put upon her into success for her descendants. The final story that we have highlighted in this series is about a woman named Charity Southgate. Charity Southgate um, was actually born in Virginia in 1806, and Charity was born to a white mother and it's understood that her father was a man of African descent. Virginia in 1806, um, for a white woman to have a child of mixed race is very, very difficult. We don't know the circumstances of, of her parents' relationship, but we do know that that was the case. At about age two, Charity was sent away to Kentucky. The, the family that she came with um, had some connection to Charity's birth mother's family. And so this was some sort of favor. Her status was known to the family, meaning she was born to a free white woman. And that means, by Virginia law and Kentucky law, that she was free. Regardless of having any African heritage, she would have been a free woman. Uh, when she became about 13 or 14 years old, a man came and um, produced power of attorney for the Palmer family, and that was the family that her mother was a part of, and said that he had come to get her. And he took Charity, and he brought her to Pendleton County, which is also in northern Kentucky. It's, um, it's a couple counties over from where we are. Um, Charity was then dropped off at the home of this man where she was held as a slave, even though he claimed later that he didn't own her at that point. At some point later, he was given permission to sell her, or told to sell her. When she was 19, she got married in the home of the man that, that, that first held her in, in Pendleton County. Um, she had a child with him and then was sold. And her second child was born um, a couple years later. Over the ensuing years, uh, Charity made it very well known that she should not be held as a slave and nor should her children because again she was born to a free mother and so were they. She brought suit with the help of an attorney and fought for her freedom for 20 years. She finally received her freedom and then had to fight for the freedom of her children. What's remarkable about Charity's legacy to me is that her life was a life of disruption, right? So she was her life was disrupted at two years old when she was taken to Kentucky. Disrupted again at about 13 or 14. Disrupted again when she sold back and forth and then she became a disruptor. She is known in the town of Falmouth, which is in Pendleton County. 
she is known as the mother of the free African-American community there. She um, obtained the freedom of her children, her grandchildren. They built houses. They started a church. Uh, there was a whole neighborhood that really can be traced right back to charity, and it was called Happy Hollow. And so she built this community in a slave state and was able to pass all this strength and success on to the generations that came after her. Thank you, Hillary, for taking the time to share these important stories with us today. For the rest of you, we hope to see you next time right back here at the Ranger Roadshow.